Hello lovely internet strangers. In this video I'm going to discuss a recent bit of news out of the publishing industry. For those of you who don't know, in the past I worked in the publishing industry for several years, so this is my perspective as a former insider. With this former insider perspective I will do my best to break down this letter and also provide some additional context and thoughts. Without further ado, the topic at hand. This is a letter of intent from publishing professionals of the United States. So right off the bat I want to point out that this is simply a letter of intent, meaning it lays out their intentions, what they intend to do, but this letter has no real force or impact. In my opinion, this is just a bunch of empty words, a lot of virtue signaling, and I'll get into why I think so. To the text of the letter, we all love book publishing, but we have to be honest. Our country is where it is in part because publishing has chased the money and notoriety of some pretty sketchy people and has granted those same people both the imprimatur of respectability and a lot of money through sweetheart book deals. You can tell they're trying to sound fancy and important by using the word imprimatur, which just means essentially giving an endorsement of someone or something as good, though the word is specific to publishing. The statement about our country being where it is because of publishing chasing money and notoriety of some pretty sketchy people is super vague. I mean, are they just talking about political figures who have gotten book deals or are they talking about various stripes of celebrities who have gotten book deals over the years? But but as a former insider and as someone who still loves books, I have to disagree with their assessment that our country is where it is in any significant part because of book deals. I think that publishing has chased certain book deals in an attempt to make money because they are private companies trying to make profit, but the reasons that they pursued those book deals were because of what was already happening in the country that made those companies think that people would pay money to read books from those people. As members of the writing and publishing community of the United States, we have Firm that participation in the administration of Donald Trump must be considered a uniquely mitigating criterion for publishing houses when considering book deals. Why? Let's see if they clarify in the next paragraph. Consequently, we believe no participant in an administration that caged children, performed involuntary surgeries on captive women, and scoffed at science as millions were infected with a deadly virus should be enriched by the almost rote largess of a big book deal, and no one who incited, suborned, instigated, or otherwise supported the January 6, 2021 coup attempt should have their philosophies remunerated and disseminated through our beloved publishing houses. Where do I even begin to parse this paragraph? So they are not only calling for what you would expect, which is to say that Donald Trump shouldn't get a book deal. I definitely expected people in the publishing industry to come out with some kind of statement about not publishing Donald Trump, considering the history in recent years of the publishing industry moving to cancel certain books. But this is a much more sweeping statement about anyone who participates participated in his administration before any of them have any kind of book deal on the table. This is a very, very preemptive strike. But even though they specifically say they are addressing participation in the administration of Donald Trump, when they give their reasoning, the kind of administration that they are describing could also apply to, for example, the Obama administration, because the cages that the children were housed in were built during the Obama administration and used to separate children from their families for a 72 hour period. And as far as the involuntary surgeries on captive women, one, they are talking about this bit of news from last year, a whistleblower report from an ICE detention center. I'm not saying we shouldn't listen to whistleblowers, but there's no actual confirmation on this information. No one has been charged with anything, etc., etc., etc. I don't doubt that this happened. However, this is an article from a very left revolutionary website, which makes clear that forced history hysterectomies, state sterilization. This is a practice in the United States with a long history, which I won't detail here because it's tangential to this video. But the idea that this is something that is unique to the Trump administration is laughably ignorant to anyone who knows the slightest bit about this country's history. And you would think for people who are so woke and left would know about this. However, it's not so much their wokeism and leftism that drives them here. It's really their TDS. Trump derangement syndrome for those not in the know. They're highlighting things that have nothing to do with Donald Trump's administration specifically and things that have to do with the way the United States administrative state has been set up for years. These processes that continue to churn even as administrations turn over. So going back to the letter, are they going to target any member of the Obama administration that had a book deal, including Obama, and ask them to give the profits from those books to some 
sort of anti-kids in cages charity, I would bet a lot of money that they won't. They also make it sound like with their language that we're like these imperial conquerors who came into some country and like captured the women and now we're torturing them. You can disagree with the way they're being treated, but to make it seem like we went in and just took them and they're not there because they were knowingly breaking our laws is also disingenuous. And then trying to make themselves sound smart and important again by using big words like largest. All right, jumping down. Son of Sam laws exist to prevent criminals from benefiting financially from writing about their crimes. In that spirit, those who enabled, promulgated, and covered up crimes against the American people should not be enriched through the coffers of publishing. Like what fucking year is it that they're saying coffers? Like we're in a fucking Charles Dickens novel or something. All right, we gotta pause here because I need to explain what Son of Sam laws are. For those of you who aren't familiar with the term Son of Sam, that was a name for the notorious serial killer who was on the loose in New York City during the summer of 1977. And the original law that had this name originated in New York, understandably, and it was designed to keep criminals like Son of Sam from profiting off of publicity from their crimes, usually by selling their stories to publishers. And this law was on the books and used for a couple dozen years until in 1987, Simon & Schuster sued New York authorities to prevent the enforcement of this law because they were about to publish a book called Wise Guy, which was about next mobster. And if you've seen the film Goodfellas, then you'll be familiar with this because that was the basis for the film. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court in 1991. They ruled eight to zero that the law was unconstitutional. The majority opinion found that the law was over-inclusive and would have even prevented the publication of something like the autobiography of Malcolm X. So after a bunch of revisions, New York State adopted a new Son of Sam law in 2001. So this new law just requires that victims of crimes are notified whenever a person who's convicted of that crime receives 10,000 US dollars or more pretty much from anywhere, which would include a book deal. And in certain cases, this law could be extended beyond just the criminals to their friends, family, etc., who would want want to tell their version of the story and profit. So going back to the letter, they are referencing a law that no longer exists because the current law only requires notification of a certain amount of money earned. It does not prevent the criminal from earning that money. And even if the law that they were talking about existed, it requires the person to be convicted of a crime. And none of the people that they are referring to above have been convicted of crimes in a US court of law. What they are discussing above, just participating an administration that did X, Y, and Z does not constitute conviction of a crime. They may be guilty of crimes in the public opinion, in the opinion of these people, but that is not the same thing. Fortunately, that has no legal standing. The letter concludes, we are writers, editors, journalists, agents, and professionals in multiple forms of publishing. We believe in the power of words and we are tired of the industry we love enriching the monsters among us and we will do whatever is in our power to stop it. I'm sure you will guys. Can't wait to see what you're going to do. Okay, so the number of people People that have signed it as of today on January 25th, 2021 is 586. The person who created the letter is Barry Liga, who's a decently known young adult author. And I scanned the list of names and honestly, there's not a lot of big names on there. There's a couple of notable young adult authors, but when I looked for names of people who have titles that give them power, for example, you can see here, Kaylin Adair, executive editor, Candlewick Press. Candlewick Press is a children's publisher. That person has no power to do anything really about members of the Trump administration getting book deals because Candlewick Press wouldn't be publishing them. Unless you're talking about them doing some kind of children's book, which sometimes happens, like Kamala Harris did one, gag me. But 99%, no one from the Trump administration is approaching Candlewick Press with a book proposal that she could then turn down and say, I won't stand for this. I won't enrich the monsters. You sign the letter by filling out a Google form and I've definitely noticed a few duplicates on here. So there's actually not 586 individual people who've signed the letter. There's slightly less than that due to Google form error. You'll note that most of the people here who aren't just authors, who have no institutional power, the people who actually work at the publishing houses, most of them have assistant in their name. So I'm not gonna go through all the names here, but those are some of the general things that jump out to me. 
I do actually know a few people on this list personally. Not really surprising because I know those particular people to have a pretty insidious case of TDS, but it kind of just made me chuckle because they definitely don't have any power and I don't know what their intent is. I went looking for this article to give me some context because the letter was sent to me directly, so I didn't know anything other than looks like they've channeled their TDS into an extremely pointless letter. Apparently the letter was originally titled No Book Deals for Traders, but that doesn't appear to be part of the final document that I saw. So they have a quote that Barry Liga, who created the letter, apparently told the Publishers Weekly, quote, traditionally members of an outgoing administration can and do rely on the cushion of a fat book contract with a healthy advance. In the case of the Trump administration and its history, of outrages, lies, and incitement to insurrection, we cannot allow this to stand. No one should be enriched for their contribution to evil. So this letter came out on the same week of the cancellation of the book deal for Missouri Senator Josh Hawley. Luckily, there are still some organizations that will speak out against this kind of thing, like America's National Coalition Against Censorship, because canceling the book weakens free expression. They see it as crucial for publishers to stand behind their decision to publish, quote, even when they strongly disagree with something the author has said. Now, I know a lot of people are going to say that blah, 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 free speech, publishers can do whatever they want, no one has a right to a book deal, etc, etc. And I totally agree. But it is chilling to a culture of free speech in the John Stuart Mill sense, where you allow the marketplace of ideas to flourish freely and for the people to decide what they want to read, what information they want to consume, what they support with their money. And normally I would go down the route of saying, well, these people are depriving other people of the right to hear certain information because they think that the people can't be trusted to make their own decisions about what's right and wrong, etc, etc. But from the text of the letter, it really appears that their focus is on not rewarding these people financially. Like they probably wouldn't care if for some reason people from the Trump administration wrote a book and then it was a free ebook. They just don't want these people being given money and especially not money from the coffers of their beloved publishing industry, that sacred fucking institution that has never published anything garbage ever. Everything that gets published is high quality, of course. This is the thing with the text of the letter where they say that the book deals grant these people an endorsement of their respectability. Only people in the publishing industry think that. (laughs) Only people who have so drunk the Kool-Aid of that culture think that just just because someone gets a book deal, that means they're a good person or legitimate or anything else. The average person doesn't see some random celebrity getting a book and think, well, I wasn't sure about them before, but now that they have a book deal with Simon & Schuster, I really am firmly sold on their respectability. Like if these people had any shred of consistency, I might have a different opinion, but they're not gonna come out with a fucking letter like this in two years, in four years about any of the Biden administration, even though the Biden administration is just taking over where the Trump administration left off, and all those things that are in place, ICE's practices, for example, are going to just continue. The administrative state will churn. Those state actors are going to do what they're going to do that Biden may not even be fucking aware of, but it's his administration, and him and everyone else is going to be complicit in all that shit, but these people aren't going to fucking care because it's not Trump. They didn't care when it was Obama and they're not going to care when it's Biden. They only care when it's Trump. And to go back to that Guardian article, there was one more quote from Barry Liga, creator of the letter, who said that each signatory to his letter, quote, will act to the dictates of their conscience and to the extent they're able to affect change, pointing to the Hachette walkout, which led to the cancellation of the Woody Allen memoir. We are committing to doing what we individually can when and if the time comes, he added. To those who believe this is censorship, I can only say this, he wrote on Twitter. If the First Amendment guarantees guarantees book deals, then there are some publishers who turned down books of mine in the past who now owe me money. Good lord. No, I don't think it's censorship because none of these people have any fucking institutional power. Even the ones who are executive editors of things have power at small presses or publishing houses that would never 
entertain any kind of book deal from any politician and I have no idea what any of them are going to do when the time comes. Like they're free to write this letter. Like I have no problem with them writing this letter. They're expressing themselves. They're basing it off of total ignorance, but they're free to write this letter. But it's honestly just a huge virtue signal. It's an easy way for people in the industry to feel like they're doing something when really they're not. If they really wanted to affect any kind of change, probably the most effective route would be to let the book deals go through, but to make sure that they have people on their side who can actually do something. Like for example, people who purchase books, people who purchase books at libraries, people who purchase books at bookstores, and get them on board with not ordering that book but they're not gonna do that because it would be really hard to pull off, especially with library purchasing, because actually, as I found out when the publishing industry went apeshit over Milo Yiannopoulos' book deal, most librarians actually have integrity and they don't discriminate in the same way that the people that wrote this letter do, regardless of their personal feelings about any particular author or topic. And library sales are a not insignificant part of any book's sales, especially general interest books like political memoirs and tell-alls tend to be. This letter is not entirely surprising to me. It's a little bit unusual for it to be a preemptive strike, a blanket statement against anyone who had anything to do with this administration before any particular book deal has happened because usually all the stories are about so-and-so has a book deal, we want you to cancel it, whether it's Woody Allen's memoir or Josh Hawley's book or Miley Yiannopoulos' book, etc. So it's a bit alarming that they've escalated to being this vague. All I can say is this letter is just another example of TDS that persists in the publishing industry even though Trump is no longer in office and these are the kind of people that believe in guilt by association whether the association of being in the administration in some role even though you had nothing to do with immigration law or ICE you're guilty by association or the guilt by association of publishing a book by someone even tangentially related to such things to such crimes as were also perpetrated by previous administrations and they didn't care because he was our candidate, yo. So even though I love books, news like this only reaffirms my decision to have left the publishing industry behind because it's hard to want to work in an industry where there's a bunch of people like that. Now to be fair, like I said, only 586 people signed this letter and these are not big names, these are not people with power, I don't think anyone's shaking in their boots but this is only an initial letter of intent, a preemptive strike, so it remains to be seen what will happen when actual members from the Trump administration seek book deals. However, those people will always have the option to publish with an independent publisher like Regenery, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, which publishes conservative and, and libertarian books, but every publishing house has an imprint that publishes conservative books for the most part. I discussed this in a video I made a while ago about the Miley Annapolis book deal. I'll link that below in case you're curious, but it's likely that most of those imprints would probably be interested in such books and don't really care what a bunch of YA authors and other random marketing assistants and publicity assistants and people at small presses think about their decision to publish books from these random politicians. So I'll keep an eye out for any follow-up on this any forthcoming book deals. If any of my subscribers ever comes across any publishing news or scandals that they're curious for my opinion on, just send them my way and I'll try to make the time to comment. I'm working on outlining a series about science fiction fantasy publishing and the Hugo Awards controversies from recent years because I've wanted to comment on that for a while, so that's in the queue. If you have any questions, please let me know with a comment or an email. Anyway, that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. If if you liked this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe, and I hope to have more content for you very soon.